Good afternoon. Ashley would like to welcome you to this webinar presented by Chris Habits of Nortec Humidity Limited, a member of the Condor Group. My name is Nicholas Lee, a Global Product Manager also with Nortec, and I will be moderating this afternoon's webinar. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few important housekeeping items. This webcast is designed to be interactive between you and the presenters. The webcast console you are looking at can be completely customized. You can resize or move any of the windows that you have open using your mouse. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets that you can use. If you have any questions during the web webcast, you can click on the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. This would be a red icon as shown on the screen right now. We'll try to answer any questions during the webcast, but if a more complete answer is needed, or if we run out of time, it'll be answered later via email. We do capture all questions. An on-demand version of this webcast will be available approximately one day after the webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Finally, if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please visit our webcast help guide by clicking on the help button below the presentation window. It has a question mark icon and covers many common technical issues. Our speaker for today is Mr. Chris Habits, who is a global product manager and is responsible for gas-fired, central steam, and steam distribution solutions at Nortec. Chris is a strong proponent of the benefits of humidification and has spoken on this topic for several ASHRAE chapters in Canada and the United States. Chris's presentation today will focus specifically on the use of efficient gas-fired humidification technologies to provide a wide variety or provide humidity for a wide variety of applications. His colleague, Marley Spiegelberg, will also be assisting by selecting Chris for, uh, questions for Chris to answer at the end of the presentation. Chris, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, as Nick mentioned, my name is Chris Habits. I'm a global product manager here at Nortec, and I'll be talking about gas-fired humidification today. Uh, so the focus is going to be a bit on applications, as well as what is gas-fired humidification, how it works, uh, what are the pitfalls of installation, uh, as well as some of the design considerations, control considerations. Um, a whole lot of gas-fired humidification will be talked about today. Uh, if you have any questions, send them in. Marley will take care of them for me, and then I'll answer as many as I can at the end. So, why are we choosing high-efficiency gas-fired humidification for our humidification needs? Before I get too much into that, let's talk about what gas-fired humidification is. It is an atmospheric steam generator. So, what that means is, at its core, we are effectively, as you can see on the screen, boiling water with gas at atmospheric pressure. There's not a lot of head generated here. We, we can't overcome large pressure differentials. So when we talk gas-fired humidification, we are talking isothermal atmospheric steam generation. Once again, and I really like to hammer this home, it's atmospheric steam. And the reason I say this so much is it is one of the installation concerns we see a lot in the field uh, is steam line running. So when you run your steam line from your gas-fired generator over to your duct or your air handler, uh, the steam line has to be built in such a way that atmospheric steam will work inside of it. It's not work like pressure steam. It doesn't work like pressure steam at all. If you have a steam line set up, something like you can see on screen, that red circled area is going to fill up with condensate produced just from heat losses in the steam line, and your gas fire generator will no longer produce steam into your duct. Um, and at some point, it will just shut down, and you'll have a steam line full of water instead of a steam line full of steam. I start off with that right away, mostly because it's so very important. We do see it so often in the field in gas-fired humidification and other isothermal humidification methods. Now, a little bit more gas-specific is why are we going to use natural gas for isothermal humidification over other isothermal technologies? Uh, when I say isothermal, I'm talking about boiling technologies. I'm talking about technologies that use electricity or gas um, or another heat source to boil water off and put that steam into a duct. So the number one reason to use natural gas, and it's the one we hear all the time, is that we are looking at a lower operational cost for natural gas compared to other technologies. Um, depending on where you are in the world or where you are in North America, your natural gas cost may be 30 to 60% less to boil water compared to your cost of electricity. Uh, another very good reason is it's more green, um, meaning customers are now wanting to have a lower environmental impact. And again, depending on where you are in the world, it's very possible that a natural gas 
natural gas humidifier will actually create less carbon emissions, less general emissions compared to other technologies, uh, including electric steam. More reasons we're using gas. Um, there's restrictions on building energy use and that, including building electricity use. And what we're seeing is restrictions coming out on how many kilowatts a building can demand. So if you're using electric humidification, what you might end up seeing is you're going over your, your demand uh, for the month that you're allowed. And natural gas humidifiers obviously have less demand. I'm sorry, I'm seeing a blank screen right now. Uh, Nick, are you seeing? I'm still good? Okay. Well, that's okay. I'll keep going. So what I can tell you is, so natural gas uses a different, different source to generate the steam than electricity, obviously, and that can save you electrical load. Um, what else we have is the natural gas is becoming a much more common uh, energy source in our economy and in North America in general, as well as uh, efficiency is becoming a major selling feature. So hopefully when I switch slides here, I'll be able to see what I'm presenting again. And I'm back. Okay. So I'm going to touch a little bit now on why humidify in general, and then we'll get back to the natural gas and, and gas-fired humidification technology. So the first reason we talk about for why humidify is, is for people. It's for increased comfort. It's to have a healthier environment. And it's therefore to have higher productivity as well. Um, a lot of the time when we're talking about air conditioning, unfortunately, the humidification part of air conditioning gets dropped. So it's regulation of the quality, temperature, and humidity in the, in the space enclosure. Now, I said healthier environment, and I'm sure a lot of people instantly said, well, why is humidity healthier? What does having a 40% room do that's better than 20% relative humidity room? And that's when I like to point out this, this chart here. This is the Sterling chart, as it's referred to. Uh, it was published by ASHRAE in 1985. Uh, I believe the AHRI community is actually working on an updated version of this. But what we see here is that bacteria and viruses, as well as allergy-causing uh, fungus, etc., tends to die off a lot faster within that optimum zone that you see highlighted on the screen. So anywhere between 40 to 60% relative humidity is somewhere where we like to, to hold our spaces in order to kill off uh, flu viruses or dangerous bacteria in the air that could make us sick. Now, obviously, there's a cost associated with humidification, but you have to compare that cost with humidification versus what your healthcare costs are, what productivity costs are, how much your temp services might cost if somebody's out for a while, and, of course, absenteeism. Um, Healthcare and productivity are, are big costs in your day-to-day -day operations, and if you're humidifying 120 to 150 square feet per person, it may very well be very cost competitive or cost effective to humidify your building for, for your people's sake, for your employees' sake. And of course, we can also talk for process. So we talked about for people, uh, for process are the ones where you see Hydrostatic properties change when the humidity levels change, uh, so that's curling paper, for example, in a printing plant, or electrostatic control that might be in a electronics manufacturing facility, or even just in your office. I, I personally don't like walking across the floor and shocking myself at every doorknob I touch. And um, again, for comfort, it's it's a big, big part of humidification, as well as other humidity-sensitive procedures, and we'll get into a few of those as I go along here. So these are where we see gas-fired humidifiers most often. I've got a couple of slides of these, but uh, office buildings and schools are very common, and those focus mostly on the comfort and, and health aspects of having well-humidified air. Um, warehouses and manufacturing plants, that can both be for dimensional stability with properly humidified air or electrostatic control and pharmaceuticals and electronics assemblies are obviously both places that need very tight humidity control and, uh, and high levels of relative humidity to make sure the pharmaceuticals don't degrade in space or that you don't shock your electronics assembly while you're putting together your controllers, uh, stuff like that. Um, historically, we've seen a lot of use of gas-fired humidification in, in museums and art galleries. 
uh, a lot of traveling exhibits won't allow you to host your that exhibit at the museum if you can't show you can control your humidity properly. So we do see a lot of gas fired in museums and galleries. These are getting to be pretty large loads there. Retirement homes and hospitals. Uh, retirement homes can be very great for the the elderly people who are living there. Um, the older you get, the more your skin tends to crack, and the drier it is, the more your skin tends to crack. So when we see humidification in retirement homes, it's great for the residents there. And hospitals obviously need a humidity uh, to stay in the higher range to, again, prevent diseases from spreading. And then, of course, laboratories and test facilities uh, have high, high humidity requirements and tight humidity requirements, which we can do with gas fire humidification. And then a couple more unique applications we've seen gas fired humidifiers in. Uh, we have them in some bread proofing boxes, which actually start out at about uh, 120 Fahrenheit and 90%, and then slowly decrease the humidity, uh, as well as paint booths, which is a similar idea except in a, a larger, larger facility. Uh, we have quite a few vivariums actually that we humidify with gas-fired humidification where we're putting in humidity to make sure that the plants and animals in that space is, is properly humidified and that's a federally controlled humidification requirement. Uh, we also see some veterinary clinics and then post-processing which is literally uh, mail processing. You can see the Canada Post building we humidified there and amphitheaters as well. Um, Humidity percentage in space can affect sound quality and, of course, comfort for your, your guests. Um, those are a few more unique gas-fired applications that we've seen. Again, uh, that's going to be about it for the application side of things, but if you do have questions on these, send them in to Marley uh, through the Q&A button at the bottom, and I'll be sure to get to as many as I can at the end and as many more as I can by email afterwards. So let's talk a little bit about installation. I know I've already talked about atmospheric steam, but I like to hit it on the head quite a few times because it is something that we see in the field on a, a very regular basis is steam lines that do not conform to, to our requirements or to any manufacturer's requirements of, of gas-fired humidification. So the first thing to keep in mind and to tell the contractor and to make sure your engineer knows is that it's, it's not pressure steam. It is atmospheric steam. And when it's atmospheric steam, even though we do recommend uh, insulating your steam lines, there will be condensate um, generated within the steam lines, and it must be removed as well. Uh, so that typically means a condensate trap every 15 linear feet at every low point, um, any point that you transition from horizontal to vertical, et cetera. Uh, condensate needs to be removed from the steam lines. And I know that a lot of you right there are thinking dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign about how many condensate traps you might have to put in, which is why we really recommend limiting the length of the steam line as much as possible. Uh, if you can put your gas-fired humidifier three feet away from your air handler unit and run that steam line a total of four feet, including bends, that's what we like to see, and that's, that's best practice when installing any isothermal humidifier. Of course, when we're talking gas, we also have to talk about venting. And the first thing we say with every job is to make sure local codes are followed. If we're not following local codes, obviously there's going to be problems on site, um, whether that's technical problems or legal problems. Um, following local codes is, is very, very important. I'll talk more about condensate removal a little bit later, but if it's a system that does produce condensate and it's rated to produce condensate, we do need to make sure that we're properly removing it from the system. And then we'll talk a little bit about this, but venting across different pressure zones can cause problems. So that's if you're using a sealed combustion method to vent your unit. So that's taking outside air uh, through a pipe into your unit and then obviously venting outside again. If you've installed your outside air um, intake in a very negative pressure zone and uh, the exhaust outtake in a positive pressure zone, you might see backflow. Now, most humidifiers, ours included, have a way of addressing this so that the unit will shut itself down before you have backflow through the unit. 
but then you have a unit that's not operating better than exhaust gases in your space, but not as good as an operating unit venting properly, obviously. So a little bit more on the venting side of things. Um, can we use, what kind of venting do we have to use? If it's stainless steel B vent or special gas vent, or um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, what plastics are allowed or any plastics allowed, and that again very much depends on the unit you're, you're purchasing and installing, and uh, that's where the high efficiency side of things will come in as well. And then what other concerns are there? Can you vent out a sidewall? Can you use a concentric vent terminal? Uh, what are your maximum lengths? The general, and unfortunately very general answer on that, is make sure you follow the manufacturer's recommendations. Uh, they are, local codes all require you to follow manufacturer recommendations. Sorry about that. Um, so maximum lengths vary greatly depending on which, um, which manufacturer you may be using. Concentric vent limits are depending again on whether or not the manufacturer is certified. Sidewall, some manufacturers like us uh, have to use a special gas vent to get out the sidewall. Other manufacturers may use a power vent. So again, it all depends on, on what your manufacturer of your product allows. In terms of plastics, there's polypropylene, there's CPVC, and if the exhaust temperatures are low enough, you are allowed to use those products. And uh, it's actually encouraged if you're using a high efficiency gas fired appliance to use those products. It saves on cost, cost and installation cost. Uh, but that being said, it has to be a high efficiency product to do that. And we'll talk more about that later as well. Uh, briefly touched on this, but on flue gas condensate removal, some local codes need to neutralize that condensate. In Ontario, Canada, where I am, we don't actually need to do so. We can just take it straight to drain as long as it's mixed with drain water from the unit. In other places, you may need to neutralize that condensate before bringing it to drain. Uh, it very much depends on your local code. And then, of course, and this is becoming more and more of a concern uh, with every mechanical room I've seen, Mechanical rooms are getting very tight. People like to fit as much into as small a space as possible. So with that in mind, each manufacturer obviously publishes their, their clearances and their footprints of the units, and you really want to make sure that you are respecting those clearances. Uh, when these units need serviced, if they need serviced, you, you do need the room to work in, and manufacturers publish them for a reason. So please, when you're finding room for it, make sure you find all the room you need for it. And then again, we need to keep as close as possible to the point of distribution. And by that I mean steam distribution. So again, if you're three feet away from your air handler unit, that's a great place to be. If you're 20 feet away, uh, you can make it work. If you're 100 feet away, you'll need to really oversize your humidifier in order to take care of all that condensate loss you're going to see. And we were just talking about venting. You probably do want to try and keep your unit as close as possible to either your sidewall you're venting out of or with a nice, clear, straight-up path for your venting to go. On the water inlet side of things, it's a fairly simple system. We have, we and other manufacturers use fill valves. Uh, we publish the pressure that needs to be seen there. What we have seen before is swings in water pressure that disrupts humidification. So that could be a large, uh, large hose gets turned on somewhere in the building and drops pressure to the unit. And I picked that example because I have actually seen it on, on a site. And when the water pressure drops, the unit might fault out um, or it might start producing a little bit less steam to keep the water level higher. And then low pressure and high pressure can cause problems, whether those are faults or, or damaged fill valves. Uh, so keep your water pressure within the range recommended by the manufacturer. On the drain side, this is an interesting one when it comes to, to humidification, uh, especially even gas-fired humidification. So drain water cooling is required, and most manufacturers either include it or have it as an option, uh, but I don't know of a single plumbing code that allows you to dump 212 degree water down the drain, uh, at least not in North America. So we need to make sure we're using drain water cooling. And then there's also freeze protection, or what the industry calls freeze protection. And what that is, is if the power is cut to a unit, whether it be an outdoor unit or 
an indoor unit with freeze protection installed. The unit as a safety to avoid basically turning into an iceberg will dump all the water down the drain instantly in just a normally open drain valve. So that could mean 212 degree water coming down the drain and it's something that you need to be prepared for whether that's with a self-actuated drain water cooler to protect the pipes inside from scalding hot water or if it's copper drain piping. Uh, whatever needs to be done should be done uh, because obviously 212 water in PVC piping can cause a real problem. And then size your drains properly. Uh, these units do, when draining, put out quite a fair amount of water and it's important to follow manufacturer's recommendations. And it's also good to know that the units don't have any lift. Uh, so if you need to bring your drain somewhere, uh, you may need a condensate pump um, to, to pull it up and away. So I've covered a fair amount of installation concerns there, and again, direct questions to through the Q&A, and I'll cover it at the end. So I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about gas-fired load sizing, which is basically the same as all other isothermal load sizing. We just tend to have larger numbers by the end of it. Um, but if we're going back to our basics and psychrometrics, it's the humidity ratio is, is where we start. So that's the mass of water compared to the mass of dry air. That can be generally seen as grains per pound within the humidification industry, or pounds per pound is acceptable as well, or if you prefer metric, grams per kilogram. Now we start with a 30 grains of water per pound of air, so that's the humid humidity ratio. Uh, it's basically saying we have 30 grains, which is a very small amount of pounds. It's divided by 7,000 uh, grains of water per pound of air, and that's, that's saturated at 35 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you have that much water in the air at 35, it's a foggy morning. Um, you bring that air inside and you heat it to 72 Fahrenheit, and we're down to 25% relative humidity. So this is where this is where the, the load sizing comes in. This is where we actually need to add humidity to that that second cup there to bring us back up to a, a reasonable indoor relative humidity. And you can imagine if we're down at 30 Fahrenheit or 20 Fahrenheit pretty rarely a foggy morning at 20 Fahrenheit uh, and therefore we'll need to add even more steam to the airstream in order to bring us back up to to a reasonable RH. Now if we chart that we can see we start off at 35 and 100 percent relative humidity down here at the bottom left of the graph and if we follow that where we touch the 100 percent line all the way up to 72 degrees Fahrenheit you can see we're at about 25% relative humidity. And for those of you who are paying attention and have seen the psychrometric chart before, I think it's obvious where I'm going with this. You could load up your psych chart, and, and this is a perfectly valid way of doing a load sizing. You could start at your outdoor air temperature, run your finger along until you hit your relative humidity outside at your design, and then run along to the right until you find your room temperature and figure out how much water you need to add to that air to make sure your load is covered, uh, especially on these really cold February nights that we've been having. Now the other option, and this is the one I, I recommend, is most manufacturers offer online tools to do this for you. Um, they're all free to access, they're commitment free, most only require an email address. Um, they're very simple tools and it allows you to do all of this calculation a lot faster than what you do before. And of course then there's your load sizing information and product information can all be exported right from there. Now, the products are going to be from that specific manufacturer, obviously, but it can be a very useful tool to simplify your load sizing process and make sure you've got the, the right product selected uh, for, your, for your job. So on the load sizing thing, I'm not going to get into too much more detail, but I'd be happy to answer questions later. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about design considerations now. So you've got your load, you've decided on a gas-fired humidifier, and what we'll want to know is how you're going to put that steam into the duct, uh, what your control strategy might be, and what safeties and limits you need to put on your system to make sure you don't over oversaturate the duct or your space. The most common thing that we see is a steam distribution grid. The Nortec product is called the SAMe short absorption manifold, and that's the, the larger unit in the top right there. And that 
will fit directly into the duct or air handler and steam will come out of every one of those tubes. Now these can be insulated or not insulated. We generally do highly recommend an insulated tube and an insulated header. Uh, it saves a lot of condensate from being produced within the duct and it prevents heat gain in the duct as well. The other option are steam lances in the duct and that's in the bottom right. And we can also put in directly in space with steam. Um, depending on your load, if it's a 50 pound load, in space can work quite nicely. If it's a 600 pounds per hour load, uh, in space means you've got quite a few in space blowers happening there to make sure you get your proper distribution in the space. Uh, so with gas fired, we do typically see it in the duct or in the air handler unit. And then of course, if you're inside a duct or air handler, you do have absorption distance concerns. You have to make sure that your absorption distance doesn't wet anything downstream from the humidifier. So if our ideal uh, situation for one of these SAMEs or dispersion grids is to have the heating coils followed by the SAMI in the duct, and then downstream you have the cooling coil from that, and that cooling coil is outside of your calculated absorption distance. Now that can be anywhere from two or three inches to three or four feet, depending on duct conditions, air velocity. Uh, it's, it's actually quite a complicated formula that we use, but um, NortechHelp.com, that's our load sizing tool, can be used, and our, our competitors and other manufacturers also have load sizing tools that will give absorption distance calculations. From there, we'll move on to controls. Uh, historically, a lot of HVAC has used on-off controls, as I'm sure most of you are aware, and has moved to modulating controls, and humidification is no different. Um, for gas-fired humidification, we really strongly do not recommend an on-off system. Using an on-off system on a gas-fired humidifier is the the equivalent of driving your car on a highway and trying to aim for 60 miles per hour by flooring it until you hit 65 and then letting go of the gas entirely until you're at 55 and doing that repeatedly. Uh, it's not great for the system and it's really not a good way for us to, to control a gas-fired humidifier. Of course, then how do we do it? Well, there's a demand control or transducer controls. These are more simple uh, modulating stats. The Demand controls basically means you can control the humid humidity on the humidistat itself. And you can say, I want this room to be at 55%, uh, whereas the transducer just tells the humidifier what the humidity in the room is, and then the humidifier is where you set, set your set point, et cetera. And of course, we can operate with building management systems and integrate directly there so that it's all done through the building management system, and uh, the humidifier just does what it's told. Finally, a little bit more on safeties and limits. A uh, big one is an air proving switch within the air handler unit. This is, uh, we don't sell a system without an air proving switch somewhere in the system. And this is because if you put steam into an air handler without the airflow, uh, you basically just end up with condensation all over your, your uh, air handler. And uh, it's not a good thing. So the air proving switch is very important. We also strongly recommend a duct high limit. So this prevents downstream of the, the SAMI or the steam dispersion, uh, prevents the duct from getting too humidified. We typically see these set at 80 or 85 percent, and we do like to see modulating high limits with gas-fired humidifiers. So if we start getting too humid in the duct, uh, it'll tone down the humidifier a little bit and keep make sure we're within the right range of humidity within the duct. And then, of course, any other on-off controls you might have. So these are safeties. Uh, if you're getting too humid in the space, suddenly you may want to, the unit may want to be shut down. could use occupancy sensors potentially, although that hasn't been seen too much in the humidification industry yet, but it could be done. And uh, anything else that may be needed, perhaps even just a switch if you're in a laboratory and it's a, I need to have this room humidified now, something like that. That's about it on the design consideration side of things. And again, direct your questions to the Q&A. I'll talk a little bit about where technologies come from and, and where we are today. And I'll last uh, about 15 minutes here of the presentation before I take some more questions. So 20 years ago is approximately the time we saw the gas-fired humidification technology launch. Um, generally at that time, it was a new technology and it was based on high load applications for the most part. 
you know, 200 pounds per hour plus. Although there were smaller systems, it became cost effective at about 200 pounds plus. Uh, there were some growing pains with these old gas-fired humidifiers. Any new technology has them. And there was a fairly high capital cost to install and, and purchase these units. And efficiency was floating somewhere in the 75 to 80 percent range 20 years ago when these were first launched. Of course, we, uh, every manufacturer worked hard to uh, continue innovating, so technology became more refined and more reliable, um, as well as the capital cost became more reasonable over time with compared, in compared to the cost of the units. So what we ended up having is uh, you know, a 100 pound an hour load or an 80 pound an hour load even could be reasonably done by a gas-fired humidifier uh, for, with a reasonable payback. And our efficiency started to creep up we went to maybe 80, 82 percent is what we're seeing now as an industry standard. And that's from 10 years ago until, until now. So then I'll get to what we really came here to talk about, which is true high efficiency condensing appliances. So this is hitting 90, 91 percent uh, with the higher heating value, so true condensing appliances. And this is the first product of its kind on the market. So what we're seeing with this is we're cooling exhaust gases beyond the dew point in order to extract both the, uh, the, the heat from the exhaust gases and the latent energy as well uh, by condensing out condensate and, and draining that away and using that taken energy to put back into the tank. So what we, we do that with a secondary heat exchanger and uh, a very sophisticated water management system, which I'll, I'll touch on a little bit more. But now that we're talking 90, 91% efficiencies, we need to re look at our, our venting again. Now, in the past, mid-efficiency appliances really can only use stainless steel venting. Uh, so that would either be Category 1B vent or Category 3 um, AL294C stainless venting. And, and that's all that we've been allowed to use for, for decades with gas-fired humidification because our exhaust temperatures were always in the 320 Fahrenheit plus range, uh, which of course is, is too hot for any plastics. But these appliances are now condensing category four venting appliances. So that means we can use CPVC or polypropylene, or again, we can use the AL29 stainless special gas vent as well. Uh, can't use category one or two venting on these products. These are category four only. So that basically means it has to be a sealed and condensate approved system. Um, now CPVC, depending on where you live, may or may not be allowed. Again, we're referring back to local codes as I'm sure I've said too many times already today. Uh, but polypropylene is a, a newer technology in North America, although an older one in Europe. And it's a system that allows you to go to a higher temperature in exhaust. I believe it actually allows 220 or 230 Fahrenheit, and uh, whereas CPVC maxes out at, I believe, 170 Fahrenheit. And then, of course, stainless can go up to whatever temperature um, any of our gas-fired appliances are going to reach. So we hit these lower temperatures, as I was talking about, with a secondary heat exchanger. Now you can just see it on the right-hand side of that unit. Um, what the reason we need a secondary heat exchanger is we would never have reached condensation temperatures or the dew point in the exhaust gases from the main heat exchanger. That's because we're boiling at atmospheric conditions. When you're boiling at atmospheric conditions, the lowest temperature you'll hit inside that flue gases, and this is with perfect energy transfer, is, is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And we wouldn't see condensation coming out of that. Um, and it's not perfect energy transfer conditions, obviously, so we don't hit 212 degrees Fahrenheit coming out of the, the primary or the main heat exchanger. So that's what a mid-efficiency unit ends. After that main heat exchanger, we come out at 320, 340 Fahrenheit, perhaps even a little higher, and allow all that energy to escape out the stainless steel exhaust vent. So what we're doing now is instead we're using a secondary heat exchanger that flows cool, fresh water, uh, potable water from the source, down through the heat exchanger while hot exhaust gases are escaping up. And we take that fresh water and we put it back into the tank after it's preheated. And of course, as we're preheating that fresh water, 
we're condensing out energy and water from the exhaust gases and cooling the exhaust gases as well, all within that secondary heat exchanger there. So that's the, the basics of how the, the physical, the water flows. But the reason I said a sophisticated water management system is because we're really aiming to keep the, the water level in the tank constant. So how we do this is there's actually a couple of micro pumps, very small pumps buried within this unit that pull water from the fill box or from the fresh water source and modulate with steam output. So what we're doing is if we're putting out 100 pounds an hour of steam, we are pulling through 100 pounds an hour of water at a very constant rate through that secondary heat exchanger. And what this makes sure is that we keep our flue gas below 160 degrees Fahrenheit, that actually pretty far below 160 degrees Fahrenheit. That's where our high limit kicks in. And our high limit, you can actually see right above that secondary heat exchanger, just to the right on hand side. Um, and that high limit there is set to shut down the unit at 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so in terms of emissions coming out of this secondary and out of this unit in general, well, of course, we use less gas, so there's going to be less carbon emissions compared to a mid-efficiency unit. Uh, we, like I said, we hit about 90, 91% on these high-efficient units compared to 80 to 82% on a, on a good day on the mid-efficiency units. And we also will have models available that actually meet California emission standards, specifically the NOx limits, uh, nitrous oxide limits, where California and other areas that see uh, a concentration of exhaust gases on, on bad weather days or every day, depending on where you are, um, they have very strict requirements on how much NOx uh, an appliance can release. So these new units are both high efficient and meet the California emission standards. In terms of output range or how big or small these units get, uh, we're talking 50 to 600 pounds an hour is the unit rated output size. So we have a 50 pound per hour model all the way up to a 600 pound per hour model. Um, some, of our, some of the other manufacturers do go a little bit larger than that, but nobody goes smaller than 50. It's, uh, again, it, it comes down to cost. But now what we are seeing is a 40 pound or a 50 pound load can be of cost effective to go to gas-fired humidification. So that's with high efficiency products, obviously. With mid efficiency products, we still have, we have the same range of sizes, but it can be a little bit tougher to justify gas, depending on your load size at those lower ranges. And then, of course, the turndown ratio is very important. So I can tell you it's a 50 pound per hour system, but if it only does 50 pounds per hour and it can't modulate down, then everything I told you about modulating controls was useless. But of course, we do modulate and every manufacturer allows their gas fired product to modulate. And you just need to make sure you bring it down. You can modulate low enough to hit your shoulder season or your lower humidity requirement time of year. Um, so we see five to one turn down ratio on the smaller products, generally as a rule of thumb, four to one to five to one. And the larger you get, the larger the turn down ratio actually becomes as well. Um, all of the products I'm showing here can modulate down at least to 30 pounds an hour, and the 50 will go down to 10, 10 to 12 pounds an hour. In terms of building management integration, most manufacturers offer a building management system uh, included, so that would be Backmode IP or MSTP. Um, there are also Lawnworks options. Uh, it depends on what manufacturer you're going with, whether it's included or as an option. Uh, but they, all systems will, will have it available. Uh, so, next thing I have here is this is the, the Nortec GS series. Um, if you went to try and buy a high efficiency humidifier today, you, you would have some problems doing so. Uh, this is the first one on the market and it will launch in this spring. So coming up in the next couple of months, we will have this available. But it really changes the game in, in gas-fired humidification and in humidification in general and we're very excited to have it out there. So with that, I'm going to wrap up and let Marley send through some questions to me. But before we do that, again, my name is Chris Habits. I'm the Global Product Manager at Nortec Humidity for the gas-fired products, along with a few others. 
Uh, you can reach me by email at that email address or through the questions at the end here, and I will respond to all of them, whether that's now or through email. And uh, Marley, if you want to send a few questions on screen, I can see what I can do. So what type of humidity fluc level fluctuations do you see with gas-fired humidification, and how do we maintain steady state? So a lot of this does depend on how well designed the control system is and what type of swings we see. But generally, gas-fired humidification, you know, we'll, we will keep within easily within a 5% range, plus or minus 5% of your humidification set point. And in a well-designed system, especially with the high-efficiency units where we're keeping that constant level in the tank, uh, plus or minus 1% or 2% wouldn't be unheard of. Uh, we, we can do it. Now, again, it all depends very strongly on, on how well Sorry, on how well designed the control system is. Um, again, yeah. So what we're looking for is a system that has a fairly steady input of fresh air um, and controls that are set up away from sinks, away from uh, windows or other sources of humidity, away from fresh air ducts, uh, so that we can see a very constant level of humidification in the space. And then what the humidifier will do is, because it's maintaining a very steady water level, it does have a PI loop inside of it, and uh, or our controllers, our demand controllers, will also have a PI loop that allows us to keep very close control to that loop. And we do see steady state hit with these humidifiers. Um, once you're up to humidity, which can take, you know, depending on your load, an hour or two, uh, you'll see a very very easy steady state maintained. I hope that answers the question. If not, please send send in another one. Miley, okay, I'll push another, another one. Yep. Thank you. So as for incoming water quality, and this is a good question, I realize now that I didn't actually talk about what we need to see coming into the water, into the unit. My favorite thing to see coming into the unit is reverse osmosis water. And coming back to the last question, the cleaner your water is, the easier it is to maintain an, an easy humidity set point. Uh, but it doesn't have to be reverse osmosis. Um, every manufacturer will publish different levels, but for us, uh, any, anything potable water is the rule of thumb. Potable through DI. Does that, I hope that answers the question, but it, it really can be quite a large range of water. When you're using potable water, if it's a harder water, if we're talking eight or nine grains per gallon uh, and fairly chloride heavy as well, then we like to see a higher blowdown on the units. So we'll drain more water to keep them cleaner and keep those from uh, building up inside the tank. But the units will work on, I believe, anything 0 to 12 grains per gallon and 0 to 50 parts per million chlorides, um, 0 being the much better number on both of those. Go ahead, Marley. For an 800 pounds per hour load, could two 400 pounds per hour high efficiency units be, yes, sorry, be combined and controlled together? Yes, they could. Um, it actually, you could set them up in parallel or uh, daisy chained or one after the other so that your modulation is better. Um, they can also be combined to one steam distributor. You don't need two SAMEs in the duct or two distributors in the duct. Um, all of this can be done without any additional software or additional hardware. Uh, it can be done in field. It helps if you tell the factory in advance that that's what you want to do, but in general there's it, it's very easy to do, and it can work very nicely. Good question. And Marley, go ahead. Uh, is there a difference in venting guidelines between the new model and old model? So in terms of venting guidelines, yes, in that we've certified a few more products to be allowed to vent with, such as CPVC and polypropylene are the big ones. Uh, we're also working with concentric vent now, but overall links are approximately the same, 100 feet in and 100 feet out. Uh, as for performance, it, 
the big difference is obviously in the efficiency of the product. So we're seeing 90% compared to 80% efficiency. Um, general times for cleaning will be approximately the same, although we've made changes to make cleaning easier. Um, longevity should be even better on these new units than on the old units, although we had perfect, we had done quite a good job with that on the old units as well by the time we were getting around to replacing them now. So performance-wise, you'll see a little bit tighter control on the new high-efficiency models and less expensive venting, uh, but the, the core concept is still obviously the same. Go ahead, Marley. So the sweet spot range of square feet for choosing gas fire humidification, it's not actually based on square footage. Yeah, that's a more complicated question than it should be. It, it's based more on load. So what we're looking at, for me, you hit 40 pounds an hour, and it's really time to start considering high-efficiency gas-fired humidification. Um, in terms of square footage, the reason I, I hedge a bit on that is because it depends on how much fresh air you're coming in and less on how much square footage your building has. Uh, if it's a, if you have two people in a thousand square foot office, then you need less fresh air than if you have uh, 30 people in a thousand square feet, obviously. So it really depends on fresh air, and your fresh air controls your humidity level. Um, the easiest way to do it is to go to one of these online load sizing programs and just say, I have 5,000 CFM fresh air and 20,000 CFM total air. What's my load per, per hour? Um, and, and like I said, about 40, 40 pounds is where I'd start really considering gas-fired humidification and, and get an idea of the installation costs against an electric unit, for example. Go ahead, Marley. Yeah, so we just touched on this a little bit, but I would, I personally say about 40 pounds an hour. It depends very much on your the rates for natural gas and electricity in your area. Um, in Ontario, we pay fairly high rates for electricity, so natural gas can become attractive at a lower a lower pounds per hour. But if you have very inexpensive electricity, potentially it's 100 pounds an hour that makes sense, or 120 pounds an hour. There are, again, on nortechhelp.com, there is a calculator that allows you to put in what your gas rate is, what your electricity rate is, water rate, et cetera, and compare costs over the years. So you can see your insulation cost, and you can see uh, compare that to your yearly cost as well. Go ahead. Yes, so clean steam unification is a very good question. Uh, because it's, it is a steam, and it's coming from potable water source. So if you use RO water, you have very, very clean steam being generated from the gas-fired humidifiers, and it, it can be used in clean rooms. If you use DI water, it, it's definitely safe for clean rooms, but then, of course, you need to make sure you're using stainless steel piping. Um, the humidifier itself doesn't change when we're using DI water, uh, but it can be used for, for cleaning room, clean rooms applications, and it, it is very clean steam. Go ahead, Marley. Good question. Uh, can one humidifier be used with multiple air handler units? It is possible, but it's not recommended, and the reason for that is all of the gas products on the market have one tank for water and one, one control uh, system. So as much as you could set it up with dual controls, so either system can call for humidity and make sure you've got as much humidification as the lower one is calling for, one of your two air handler units is probably going to be getting not enough humidity to satisfy the load. So it can be safely done, but the problem is that it, it, it may not satisfy your load in the uh, higher humidity base. Now, there are ways to get around that, but generally we recommend, and other manufacturers will recommend, using two humidifiers for two AHUs. Um, it's just the, the easier and, and more effective way to do it. Unfortunately. Go ahead, Marley. So that 
depends on the the unit you're ordering. Um, off the top of my head, I don't actually have the answer for that one, but I will uh, I will get back to you on the fresh air quantity required. It is if you go to humidity.com or find any of our other other manufacturers manuals for their units, you will be able to see what the fresh air required is. It'll show it in uh, square inches. Uh, square inches hole required in the wall to make sure you have enough fresh air coming in. I, I hope that answers the question. The other option is this may have been asking about the amount of fresh air required uh, for the air handler unit, and in that case there there is no limit. It's just if you have no fresh air, you probably have a smaller load. Um, if either of those didn't answer your question, call or send another one in. And I will get back to you specifically about the fresh air requirement for gas fire dehumidifications on, on Nortec products. So we do actually have a strainer inside the unit on the fill valves. Uh, the micro pumps, if you run through anything that's getting through our strainer, we're fine. If the strainer is removed or if something larger gets through, the micro pumps can be damaged by the chunks of sand, uh, etc. They are easily replaceable if they are damaged, but obviously we'd prefer to to have no sediments coming through. Um, the safe way to do it is to put a, a five micron filter um, on the inlet of the unit, uh, but it, it's often not necessary. We haven't had had problems in our testing or in our initial units going out the door here and uh, I believe I believe we're okay. Go ahead. Uh, for an office space is it necessary to measure humidity in each room or is it measured in the supply airstream? Good question. Uh, it depends on the layout of your office. If you've got closed doors, lots of closed doors within the office, I would probably suggest trying to take an, an average with each room being measured individually, but if it's a more open office, um, I'd actually recommend measuring in the return airstream and not the supply airstream. So it's a good good opportunity to mention this. If you're controlling through the supply airstream, you'll see larger swings in humidity. And that's because the supply air will come up to humidity very quickly the return airstream is, is the best place to put your controller for your control to control humidity from. And in that place, you've got a very good, very good understanding of uh, where all the air is coming from. All the air is mixed, and you've got a very good uh, cross-section of the, the humidity in the space. So generally, we don't recommend putting controls in the supply airstream, only in the return airstream or in the room itself. I hope that answers that one. Go ahead, Marley. So the efficiency payback on a gas-fired humidifier versus electric, it, again, it depends on your load. I, I hate saying it depends, but it does depend on your load. If you have a 50 pound per hour load and you're installing from scratch, so you can either choose to install a gas or an electric humidifier, at 50 pounds an hour you're looking at about two to two and a half years depending on uh, your rates and how much your contractor is going to charge to bring your gas line out and your venting through, et cetera. Uh, if you get up to 100 pounds an hour, it's uh, a year and a half to two years. And if you get up to 600 pounds an hour, your payback is in the first two or three months. Um, so I hope that answers is that question. Go ahead, Marley. The max drain water temperature, the units have internal cooling to make sure we hit below 140 Fahrenheit, which is what the, the most plumbing codes require. So 140 Fahrenheit is, is max there. It's actually more around 120 coming out, but uh, 140 is the max. And there actually isn't a safety built in with most, man, most manufacturers' systems. Um, the safety is, the way the drain water works is we're just mixing fresh water with drain water. And with the high efficiency unit, if the fresh water is too warm, there's the high limit will kick off on the exhaust, 
which will prevent drain water from getting too high. On a mid-efficiency unit, if the drain water is too warm, or the fresh water coming in is too warm, and you'd have to get very warm water here, uh, somewhere in the, sorry, I only know it in Celsius, but if you hit 25 degrees Celsius, which is equivalent to about 77 Fahrenheit, 75 Fahrenheit and inlet water, that's when you might start seeing your drain water start to creep above that 140 Fahrenheit. Uh, but there isn't a safety in the drain water at all at this point. And like I mentioned at one point in here, if you do have freeze protection on the unit, so that's an outdoor unit or an indoor unit with the option for freeze protection, if the power is cut, the unit will drain at 212 degrees Fahrenheit um, just completely because it's, it's preventing itself from freezing. Now, that means you do have to make sure your pipes are either ready for that or design in an additional drain water cooler that doesn't require electricity or something along those lines. I think I have time for one more question here, and uh, I think then we'll wrap up. So putting controls in the return airstream, does it include the airflow, airflow proving switch and high limit? So no, good question though. The airflow switch should be just before your steam dispersion grid so that you know there's air flowing over your steam dispersion grid. And the high limit should be rule of thumb about three times your absorption distance downstream. So if you have a two foot absorption distance, for example, it should be six feet away from the the steam dispersion grid. So what that high limit is doing is making sure that right after you you put the steam in, you don't start condensing on the walls of your duct. And instead you just see, uh, you keep it below that 80 or 85%. Um, it's only the room control or the, the main control that we want to see in the return airstream, but very good question. Uh, other than that, I think I'm going to wrap it up and uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out, and I think Nick wants to step in here and say a few words. All right. Well, thank you for a very interesting presentation, Chris. Um, to our audience today, we really appreciate you taking the time and investing the time uh, to join our webinar. Uh, we really hope you found some useful information that you can apply towards your upcoming projects. Uh, I know there was lots of questions here that we didn't get to. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, uh, all of these will be addressed um, through email if we weren't able to uh, get to your presentation or at, get to your question live. Uh, but I thank you for asking them. Uh, as well, Ashray will be sending a thank you message to all registrants, uh, which will include some contact information for uh, Nortec Humidity Limited. And this will let you get in uh, contact with Chris after today if you had additional questions or uh, wanted to comment on the presentation you saw today. Uh, this email should also contain any information related to the on-demand viewing of this presentation, which uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, will be available for 90 days following this. Um, so with that, I'd like to wrap everything up. I wish everybody a, a good afternoon, and thank you for joining. <laughs>